What we learned in a previous lecture was that if you take Maxwell's four equations and then you kind of uh, look for a substitution of the electric and magnetic field in terms of um, the electric and magnetic potentials, then you can combine the four Maxwell's equations into one second order differential equation, which I've written right here. Um, and I've written it now in terms of basically this, you know, second order differential equation. Um, and this one, the first one kind of doesn't look too bad, um, but the second one has um, a divergence and it has the electric potential in it. So it looks a little bit more complicated. But anyway, those, um, you basically now have a master second order differential equation, which is equal to the um, current density. So while se or solving second order differential equations is always fun, um, I recommend it to everyone, um, it sometimes can be easier to solve problems with electrodynamics with what's called a, a good selection of the gauge. Um, and so basically, how can we rewrite these um, potential functions, A and V, such that they clean up the Maxwell's equations um, and, and basically, and then solve a much simpler problem of the electric and magnetic field. So you'll see in a minute what I mean by a gauge. Um, but so let's start with first order differential equations of the curl of A remember is equal to B, and the electric field is the gradient of the electric potential minus the time derivative of the magnetic potential, like that. Okay, so what I mean by gauge is that, think of, I can imagine a mathematical form for A and V such that um, things can cancel, um, and it would get much simpler. Um, so the idea is a lot of times is what we say is that let's imagine our electric and magnetic potentials as another function prime. So A prime is equal to the original potential plus some offset. You know, And same thing is true for the scalar. V prime is equal to V plus some offset B. You can kind of think about this as, imagine I've written my functions V and A in terms of space, X, Y, and Z, and so all that I'm doing is writing down my function V in terms of, you know, X and Y, let's say, and so it has some functional form, and then what I want to do is to shift this, so now Maybe it's over here, and this is my function v prime, like so. So I'm just mathematically taking the, the, the potential, it has some functional form to it, and I'm modifying it by adding some um, gauge to it. That's what the gauge is. The gauge is just another function that you add it on, it changes the function into a new function. Um, so you, you can ask yourself, why in the world would I ever want to do that? Um, and the reason is because we're dealing with derivatives. And so now if I look at the magnetic field, I can write it as the curl of A. Um, and I can write it as the curl of A prime. And the idea is that in either case, whether I write my potential as A or A prime, the magnetic field um, isn't going to change. So it's invariant under a gauge. And so if I rewrite this, I would have on one side the, the curl of A, and the other side now the curl of A plus the curl of my gauge alpha. And so if the curl of my gauge of alpha is zero, then the magnetic field acts the exact same way whether I, whether I describe it with A or whether I describe it with A prime. And so this is going to be true under the condition that the curl of alpha is zero. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to look for a gauge alpha 
which doesn't modify my magnetic field, but does change the functional form of my potential. So we can put a um, constraint on the alpha because um, we can now write alpha as a scalar. So say, um, so let alpha equal to the, the gradient of another function lambda. Um, and this is going to, this is true if This is true. So we've been dealing with those concepts in the past. Um, that's how we were able to write the magnetic field as the curl of a, of a vector potential, um, because we knew from Maxwell's second law that the, the, the curl of a vector function is zero. Um, anyway, so now we've kind of, now we've rewritten alpha as a, a scalar gauge. Um, so let's put that into the electric field. So the electric field is now minus the gradient of V minus the time derivative of A. And what we want is an electric field that doesn't change. So this should be true for the primes, like so. Okay, um, so now let's substitute in what we have for the primes. Um, so what we have is minus delta uh, uh, minus the gradient of V minus the gradient of beta minus the derivative of a with respect to time minus the derivative of alpha with respect to time okay um, so this was going to be true right if the gradient of beta plus the um, time derivative of alpha is equal to zero. So the electric field is going to stay invariant under this gauge transformation if this condition is true. So how can we make that condition true? Well, let's substitute in alpha as the gradient of lambda. So what we have is the gradient of beta um, plus the gradient of lambda, and again I'm switching around the order of operation, um, so now I'll take the gradient after I take the time derivative of lambda, and doing that way I can now write the gradient of beta plus the time derivative of lambda is equal to zero, and that's going to be true if beta plus the time derivative of lambda is space independent. So if beta is just a constant or a function of time and lambda is a function of time and not a function of space, then this would be true. If it's spatially independent, the gradient is just going to give you a zero. So essentially, we can shift to any location in the universe we can move around to any spot in the universe and our fields would be exactly the same. So whether or not we do this experiment on Earth or in Jupiter or on Mars or in some other galaxy, it's all space independent. The only thing that our gauges now depend on is time. <clears throat> okay. Um, so let's write beta plus the time derivative of lambda as a function of time. So if we can figure out what that function of time is, then um, then maybe you know we can clean things up. So I'm going to rewrite this as beta is equal to k our function of time minus the time derivative of lambda. Um, and if you want, we could actually um, absorb that time um, function um, into our lambda, uh, I'm sorry, into our k. So let's say we um, absorb k into 
our time derivative of lambda. <clears throat> um, and so what we get is that our gauge modified vector potential A is A plus the gradient of lambda. Now that's legitimate because it's the time derivative of lambda where the gradient gives you a, um, uh, a zero. So lambda may still be um, uh, space dependent, but the derivative of lambda with respect to time is not space dependent. Okay, just want to make that clear. Um, and the electric potential V prime is V minus the time derivative of lambda with respect to time. Okay, so now what I started with was a very general equation where we had these gauges of alpha and beta, and now we've actually written it just with one constant, and that is lambda. So the idea is, is that if I can find a, um, a lambda, if I can pick a gauge, some, you know, come, try and come up with some mathematical function lambda, and, um, and then I can take the gradient of lambda and shift A. I can take the time derivative of lambda and shift V. And I can stick those into my equation for electric and magnetic field. And the electric and magnetic fields um, won't change. They'll be invariant. So that's kind of what we want to do now um, is pick a good gauge one that keeps the, the, the fields invariant, but then in the end we plug it into our equation we started with all the way back here at the beginning. So when we plug it into this equation, what we've done is that we've now um, be able to reduce that. So we want to pick a lambda that when we apply it as a gauge, it starts to eliminate a lot of those terms and simplifies the second order differential equation without ever modifying the first order differential equations of the fields. So, which sounds like a tall order, but the good news is that people have been thinking about this for over 200 years and we get to the advantage of their great experience. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop here with this lecture and then I'm gonna move on um, in the next lecture to talk about some good choices of a gauge. So what we we'll look for is good choices of gauge, lambda, which is now going to clean up that second order differential equation, allow us to solve it, um, and then without disturbing the electric and magnetic fields. Okay. Um, and the two gauges that we're gonna study, one is called the Coulomb gauge, and the other one is called the Lorentz gauge.